Our hunk of the line was the Ardennes. Pretty quiet. A lot of outfits had gone up north. I started a million latrinograms about the wearing one of our offensive. Then one day I'm standing guard and these shells start. I thought for a minute this was it. Till I realized these shells weren't outgoings, brother. They were incomings. Next thing I knew, German tanks. It was an offensive, all right. But it was going the wrong way. The offensive we were mounting to the north was suddenly forestalled and set aside, as through the rugged, thinly held Ardennes, von Rundstedt struck. He cut a fiery path through the American lines and sent his tanks desperately driving toward the river Meuse. A night of fog and pale December frost saw the beginning, none foresaw the end. He aimed for Antwerp's harbor through Liège, and all our plans held fire while we bent our strength to curb the Germans in the bulge. a replacement in England playing shove hay penny in a pub. The next day they shoved me in an aeroplane and that night I was fighting Germans and being kicked around. I don't know about the other outfits, but mine was being cut to ribbons. They were dropping all around me. The thing that still sticks in my head is the medics. The only weapon they had was a needle, but they were around right where it was the hottest. You'd hear that yell, medic, medic, and they'd always be there. Our whole division got a presidential citation for what happened up at Bastogne. Even me, just a cook. I'll never forget that old lieutenant running into the field kitchen and hollering at me if and I had any idea how to operate a bazooka. I said no, and he said, well, you're going to learn now, son. I did, and I'll be doggone if in the first shot out the barrel I didn't get me a Jerry Tank. Got interviewed later by Stars and Stripes. They said it was a crackerjack story. I tell it at the drop of a hat. We'd been up north where things were a bit static, so we were quite glad to be moved down to the top side of this bulge. Coming down through Belgium, we noticed how scared some of the civilians looked. Natural, I suppose. We were held in reserve for a week, and then they sent us into action. On account of the fog, we couldn't get any air coordination. You sure miss it bad when you've gotten used to it all the way since D-Day. And then on December 24th, like a Christmas present, that sun come up and after a while we was giving them the old one-two again. We stopped them dead, finally. It cost us plenty of men, but we stopped them. And we started moving ahead again, the rest of us. reeled back on a recoiling spring. His great attempt was over, and his armies that had devoured such a wealth of blood sagged sodden towards the Rhine. At Yalta then, while dire explosions shook the German fronts, the three great architects of freedom met to fix the final blow and plot the peace. And even as they met, we moved to act upon our strategy. We wished the foe to stand and fight upon the western bank of the Grey Rhine, for there we could destroy him, outside his fortress, open, unprotected by any bridgeless river. Down we cast the gauntlet, challenging him, stand and fight.
We were attacking the north of the Canadians, round about the Reichsvold Forest and Dutch frontier area. It was wet and filthy. And they nicknamed our army commander Admiral Kriller. Well, anyway, the enemy put up some very stiff opposition. But actually, this was just what we'd hoped for. It showed that Jerry's emotions about fighting for every foot of his beloved fatherland were getting the better of his sense of strategy. And every German killed on our side of the Rhine was to make it easier for us on the further bank. And a lot of the Bosch were killed, I can tell you. Reichswald was the bloodiest show I've seen in this war. It was one of a push. The captain told me eight divisions. He usually knows. He follows things like that. I was with the outfit that took München Gladbach, I think you say it. There weren't many civilians in the streets, and even the ones that were there we weren't supposed to talk to unless we had to. There was a $65 rack for fraternization. I wonder how they happened to figure out that number. I mean, why 65? We could see the Cologne Cathedral a long time before we got there. That tower was our objective. It was on the Rhine River. We went fast, and by the time we got in the town, there wasn't too much fight left in it. Cologne was mangled, all right, but there were still a few buildings standing. I was sorry. I thought of those French cities, flattened. Anyway, we got our objective. Now we had to cross that river. I thought they must be very short of men when they put us sailors at a battle dress, lugged the assault boats on the trucks and sent us across Belgium by road. We talk about silent service. I'd never been sick at sea, but I was sick as a dog on the road. When we reached our destination, I was feeling lousy, longing for a breath of sea air, and found the whole bloody landscape under a stinking smokescreen. It was like London it was. The next day we got up to the Rhine. It was good to get a glimpse of the water again. Our air force has given the old lumps on the east bank of the Rhine, but I was still nervous. The Germans had blown the bridges and we knew the crossing would be amphib. When I'm nervous, I get off my feet. For two days before that crossing, I couldn't eat nothing but a couple of Milky Way bars. It was going to be D-Day all over again. Dangerous. A miracle. There it was, sitting there, big and black. I'm no architect, but to me, that Remagen Bridge was the most beautiful bridge in the world. In the Army, when things go as per plan, that's wonderful. But when they go better than planned, then you figure the chaplain's working overtime. It was a break getting that bridge, and we cashed in on it. And the first guys over the river were over in style. The watch on the Rhine was finished, washed up. What a coin of phrase, kaput. Across OK and everything was going fine. But suddenly I get detailed to guard some German prisoners. I'll never forget their faces when them airborne blokes started to come over. They just stood there looking up at them. And then after about half an hour of it, one of them looks at me, looks up at the sky and says, propaganda. Propaganda. 